So the, the topic that we are uh, going to explore in this next hour is a concept called interoperability. And the purpose of our research project in this area, which is a book uh, forthcoming next year, um, is to delve into something that in the internet law and policy space is almost always taken as a good thing. It's a little like um, apple pie in America. People say we want more interoperability. We want systems that work together more rather than less. Um, and we think that's basically true. We think that statement is true after lots of research and lots of ways as we'll get to. But we also think it's a little more complicated than that and that there are a bunch of really interesting questions about why interoperability matters, what are the purposes for interoperability, how we get there, uh, and what some of the adverse effects of highly interoperable systems might be, and then how we might think about mitigating some of the downsides of high levels of interoperability. Um, and what we're going to do is to take you through a series of 10 claims, 10 strong statements about interoperability using some examples as we go. And partly we're looking at historical examples running from the train tracks that have um, come together at the same gauge level over the course of history um, and currency and so forth, things that <coughs> touch on globalization uh, and otherwise in the past uh, uh, ILAW segments, through to the architectures of the future, things like cloud computing, the Internet of Things, the smart grid, and the healthcare system, all of which rely upon high levels of interoperability going forward and where we think there's an opportunity in law and policy to think through what exactly we mean when we say we want interoperability in these architectures of the future. And though we have a, uh, an argument that we're going to make, an arc, over the course of this hour, we hugely encourage uh, people to interrupt as we go. This is highly interruptible interrupt conversation. And uh, in particular, students um, who may have felt they have not yet had chances, this is an opportunity and a warm welcome from the faculty at the front of the room to jump in uh, and argue with us. We also have at least two students who have worked on relevant projects. Matthew Becker is one of the um, research assistants who has uh, written some wonderful pieces that have uh, gone into the book and are standalone case studies. Sonia McNeil has written a wonderful uh, piece on the smart grid, not part of our research, but which talks about the privacy implications of a highly interoperable smart grid. So in particular, Matthew and uh, Sonia, I hope you'll jump in and I may call on you if not. Um, but uh, others, please do as we go, and we will uh, adhere to the five vote rule. So if you have something that you want uh, to interrupt, uh, go through the question tool as well. Uh, with that, uh, Professor Dr. Gasser, you're on. Thank you, John. Uh, so welcome also from my side. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, just to add to John's opening remarks, I think the uh, topic of interoperability hopefully also provides uh, a different angle or a different way to think ab about some of the core themes we discussed over the course of the week. Um, there will be a couple of statements, as you will see, that, for instance, touch up on the question, what is the role of governments when enabling innovation? Uh, and also, what are some of the limitations uh, th and the price that we have to pay for increased interconnectedness? So to a certain extent, this session even um, links back to what we just heard from Jonathan, uh, where you know, we see some of the downsides of openness and increased almost unlimited interconnectedness. So while we have been celebrating over the course of the week openness of the internet and, uh, and talked a lot about the great things that come from this openness, I think interoperability um, is almost the question uh, the challenge um, of this concept and notion of openness in the sense of be precise about how much openness and openness with what kind of safeguards uh, to have in place to you know, foster the great things that the web brings along, but also to address and be responsible and responsive to some of the challenges we just heard about in this and previous uh, sessions, including the one on privacy. So let me start with, a, um, with the first statement. As John mentioned, we have uh, studied over the past five or six years now many case studies, a very diverse um, set of case studies actually, and looked into the question, um, when things become interoperable, in simple terms, when things start to work together, what are the effects on innovation uh, and competition in particular? Uh, so we looked at case studies such as online music systems. We looked at case studies such as barcodes on products. 
or we looked into shipping containers and many other uh, cases where interoperability plays a key role um, across uh, different industries, but of course particularly uh, we focused on information and communication technologies. Based on these case studies, uh, we've concluded actually that interop is generally desirable um, because it can lead and often leads to innovation, competition, uh, consumer choice and systemic, systemic efficiencies. Now the problem with our research was, and this links a little bit back to the methodology section too, that it's largely based on a case studies approach. Uh, we haven't found really hard uh, uh, large-scale empirical evidence to support this claim, but plenty of anecdotal evidence and plenty of case studies where we see this positive relationship between increased levels of interoperability and more uh, innovation. Now, fortunately for our, for our argument and claim here, we have uh, found uh, support in economic theory for this claim that more interoperability is good for competition and innovation uh, because more interoperability uh, reduces market entry barriers and lock-ins which in turn uh, leads to more innovation and I'm sure we'll have more um, opportunities to illustrate um, that also by looking at some of the really controversial legal cases of the past few decades including the Microsoft case and Anne-Marie uh, and Phil uh, will help us to uh, understand these cases a little bit better. A second reason uh, outside of the standard economic theory of course uh, was also coming up in ILO when uh, Eric van Hippel uh, together with Terry Fisher presented the power of user innovation and many of the examples they have shown in their session are also based on this very idea of interoperability um, which I will uh, talk about um, uh, more in a second what it actually means. So we have plenty of support from theory uh, also from this kind of new body of research on user uh, created innovation. Now a great example for this uh, uh, play between more interop and more innovation, of course, are web mashups, which are powered by open uh, APIs, which essentially allow anyone uh, to access the data or services of a particular platform. Twitter and Facebook are great illustrations here, and again, we can go in some more depth during discussion. Uh, when uh, Facebook opened up its interfaces, uh, we've seen a surge of 4,000 third-party applications that were created uh, within uh, only six months and the most uh, popular uh, applications were actually games. Now this was also shown in, in the course of ILO Ushahidi as a crisis mapping tool um, and this is another great illustration of the power of increased interoperability. Increased interoperability is not only good for technical innovations, and that seems to be a very important point, uh, but also uh, for upper level innovations, including process uh, and even human innovation. Ushahidi, as you may recall, was used in various contexts to support uh, disaster relief efforts, for instance, in uh, the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake or the um, uh, the uh, uh, crisis in, in Japan. So Ushahidi here again builds, as you recall, on uh, a set of, of uh, um, maps from, from Google and, and elsewhere from various sources and lets users and first responders map onto these maps uh, uh, incidents but also map their relief efforts and let them and organizations help coordinate uh, their efforts. So you can see how lower levels of interoperability, the technology We have used. a quick anonymous sure. question, or a question from Doc. Um, he's asking if there's a one word opposite of interoperability. Um, some answers we already have are proprietary system and non-interoperable. Yeah. I, I, I prefer non-interoperable as the opposite word. Uh, but we will talk a little bit more about that in a second because one of the claims we make is that interop is not a black and white thing but comes along a spectrum. But John, you may want to weigh in. 
I'm only going to admit to the fact that I typed in the non-interoperable answer in there as anonymous. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're on the same page. I love it. All right, so there is uh, another aspect to this relationship between in increased interop uh, and innovation, and that has more, less to do with the power of more interoperability to create new things and new applications and services, but actually that more interop can help the adoption of existing innovations. The transition from analog to digital TV in the US is a great example. It's a long story, I will keep it very short. Uh, but here the government basically <coughs> stepped in uh, to um, encourage and allow households to buy converter boxes to the people actually, uh, um, so that people could buy converter boxes who didn't want to buy new TV sets to receive the digital signals. Uh, and these converter boxes allowed uh, the, the users basically to receive digital signals but trans for them um, in a way that they can still watch TV on their old analog TV sets. Now this is kind of an interoperability fix, so on the one hand side you have digital signals, here you have analog TVs, converter boxes help to create interoperability, which then actually uh, led to the adoption of this new technology called uh, digital TV, uh, which uh, was kind of a hack or a fix to uh, overcome a particular lock-in, a technological lock-in. So that's a, a, a version, a variation uh, on the theme of uh, interoperability is good for innovation. Now, as I already mentioned, the second basic observation coming out of these case studies is that interop comes in different degrees. It's not a black and white uh, characteristics and also happens at various levels, technology layer, data layer, but also the human and institutional layer. Just a few very quick examples here. John mentioned it in the beginning. Um, technological interoperability means that systems per se can connect to one another, often through an explicit agreed upon interface. We have here the example of the golden spike that connected the first transcontinental railroads from the west coast and the east coast in the US in 1869. Uh, we have a great case study on this railway and uh, gauges interoperability. Now translate that into the digital age if you take a USB stick uh, and can, which you can plug into your computer. Obviously these are very basic technological um, approaches to interoperability. Now, closely related with this techn technological layer of interoperability is data layer interoperability. Email is, again, a very straightforward example. We can use, for instance, our uh, private Gmail account uh, and communicate with Scott, who may use Outlook on, I, don't, I doubt, should have taken someone else, yeah. But, you know, anyway, take any other, or a Mac for that matter, uh, email program, whatever, whatever your choice is, and still we can communicate with each other, read each other's emails, although we use di different applications um, uh, running on our machines. Importantly, interoperability has not only these uh, technological notions, uh, but also has a deeply human uh, side, a deeply human component, and language uh, seems to be the key example of an interoperability phenomenon uh, that we can uh, talk to each other even if we have different um, mother tongues and use different languages. Uh, a great example of interoperability in that sense that was actually created uh, in, a, in a long process is air traffic control. Uh, air traffic control uh, of course, controllers, as you all know, use English, but it has taken much longer than one would think to agree on English as the standard. And moreover, it's not just plain English, it's kind of a standard and simplified version of English that is used in air traffic. And this, pro this was a real interop problem in the sense that many of the air, air um, uh, accidents were based on miscommunications among airline pilots and misunderstanding between pilots and air traffic controllers. So to agree on a simplified, standardized English language, uh, again, was kind of a, 
um, a step towards more interoperability that uh, obviously also illustrates the human component, not only by the pilots using the language, but also that uh, interop can be a, a matter of life and death ultimately, uh, because obviously when you're in an in a air um, traffic accident, then um, you have a really human tragedy going on most of the cases. On top of these uh, levels, uh, layers of technical data and human interoperability, we have something what we call institutional or organizational interoperability. And here, uh, emergency communication is a great uh, example. Uh, and we have um, described in one of our case studies we have uh, looked at, uh, I've taken 9-11 uh, as an example and first responders. It's uh, really interesting to see uh, how not only police forces and, and uh, firefighters and other first responders use different coded language to communicate with each other. Uh, so especially a few years back, there were uh, kind of uh, like, a, if you'd say, we have a 214 here, and that may mean an officer down, or, or it may mean we need a, uh, we need additional equipment depending on what part of uh, the organization you were, whether you were a police officer or a firefighter. So there were interoperability problems in this language sense that I just mentioned. But there was also an institutional problem with it that even if police force and firefighters spoke the same language, they didn't listen to each other uh, because uh, they had different jurisdictions and different cultures, organizational cultures. So there is also this institutional sense of interoperability that can be a huge challenge uh, to overcome and to be addressed. The dramatic uh, consequence in this 9-11 context was that the firefighters in one of the towers who tried to save people uh, were listening on the radio to the police helicopters that watched that the towers get instable and would soon uh, collapse, but didn't uh, follow the evacuation order by the police from the helicopters because they said, we are firefighters, we have a different jurisdiction, and we can do that, uh, and didn't follow uh, what the colleagues in the helicopters suggested. So these are a couple of uh, examples here. Uh, but here I would like to turn over to you, John, after I praised Interop to a certain extent. Uh, it's up to you now to uh, add nuance uh, by explaining our next uh, claim. Thank you, Urs. So uh, I think the, the basic claim that Interop is a good thing um, is a, a crucial starting point, but it's also, I think, important to think about um, in what instances, particularly from a law and policy perspective, might we have concerns about um, high levels of interoperability? I think one of the core claims we're making is there's not a maximal um, level of interoperability that's always a good thing, but in fact an optimal level of interoperability um, that is often uh, a good thing. Um, and uh, so a couple of examples um, of that. I think privacy is probably the easiest um, uh, example, and there are two very similar cases uh, that have come up recently that, that demonstrate this. So um, uh, one that uh, uh, actually involved a Harvard Law School story. So Professor Rubenstein, Bill Rubenstein, um, brought a class action against the Google Corporation uh, in the Buzz case. Were there any students in the room who actually worked on that case or were, say, named plaintiffs in that case? Um, I think it's a great um, kind of local story. But the basic idea was that in response to Twitter and its rise, Google thought that it would introduce a product that would link up various um, aspects of uh, our identity in such a way as to allow uh, for a sort of Twitter killing um, application to emerge uh, connected to Gmail and the contacts. And what happened was that they created a level of interoperability. And generally speaking, um, we think that consumers like higher levels of interoperability. The web itself, email, um, mobile applications make this case. Um, but in this particular case, uh, the uh, plaintiffs claim that they did it without asking whether or not you really wanted information in your um, contact space to be something that um, connected up uh, to, this new, uh, to this new product. The net result was a class action lawsuit. Google um, admitted no um, wrongdoing, but I think um, paid up something like $8.5 million um, for having done it. Um, I think the Facebook Beacon case makes a similar um, 
uh, point and actually ended up with a remarkably similar outcome in law, which is to say that they um, decided briefly that um, if you bought something in a context outside of Facebook itself, um, in this case uh, at a company like Overstock, um, that the fact of having purchased something in Overstock would show up in your Facebook um, uh, profile on the wall. Um, the obvious um, sort of jokey claims were, what if a you know, lover bought something for uh, that person's partner who wasn't married to that person and shows up on the wall, and you know, then the uh, husband or wife sees it. That's the, um, the sort of trivial example. But I think the more fundamental one was, um, one could make an argument, this is greater levels of interoperability between services, um, and that we generally think this is a good thing, but that it introduced a concern um, in this particular context, which was obviously was done for the gain of Facebook. They were trying to make money from this, uh, this exchange of information. And it violated one of the things that we know about privacy, which is it's very context specific. That people share some information in one place that they don't expect to be shared uh, in another. And I think higher levels of interoperability, um, if we rush to them uh, willy-nilly, can have that um, effect. Um, Sonia, I don't know if, I, if you'd be willing, if I will, uh, can call on you to um, make this case in the context of the smart grid as well. Um, uh, Sonia's been doing some really terrific independent research. She has a note coming out from Jolt, I believe, um, that looks at the emergence of the smart grid. Maybe if you tell a little bit of the story of the smart grid, how it's emerging, and why it might uh, be presenting similar kinds of interop-related uh, privacy issues. Thanks. Um, one of the themes that we've been returning to in ILAW is the theme of our world is being digital. But our digital world is powered uh, by an electric grid that actually predates the microprocessor. Um, this leads to all sorts of problems. The grid is insecure, it's unreliable, and to address these problems, um, as well as to um, make greater environmental conservation possible and to create jobs, um, there's been a transition from our old analog grid to a more mature um, digital smart grid. Um, the data that is possible to ascertain about an individual based on their energy consumption in a smart grid system is pretty different than what we're used to seeing in an analog system. Um, as meters become more advanced, it's possible to determine with more granularity not only how much power people are using, but in what ways they're using it. Um, part of this is driven by appliances that will become interoperable with the electric grid, and appliances draw power uh, in slightly different ways. So the upshot, to make a long story short, is that we can learn a lot more about the life of the inside of the home based on how power is being used. Um, certain medical devices, for example, draw power in different ways um, than your refrigerator does. Uh, and this information is useful to all sorts of people, um, whether it's marketers or law enforcement. Um, so it's an example of a technology that really, that really cuts both ways, and interoperability is a big piece of that. want a smart grid on some level because it will help with climate change, say, right? It will allow us to allocate more efficiently the energy resources that we have. We think there are a variety of reasons why consumers may like it, but under current United States law, would you argue that we're sufficiently protective of consumer interests for a smart grid, or do you think there actually is a need for some kind either of um, uh, judicial interpretation of, say, the Fourth Amendment um, or change within federal law um, as a matter of legislation that um, would, in fact, help protect us in this more interoperable smart grid? Well, uh, like a good law student, I guess I'll say it, it depends, right? Uh, it depends on what our goals are. I think that um, this data is very useful from a social science standpoint, but because it's also uh, very revealing from a privacy standpoint, there's a real question about whether or not the Fourth Amendment, uh, to take one example, would adequately provide protection. At this point, it's, it doesn't seem that law enforcement would be able to get access to this information directly. Um, by conducting surveillance rather than by going and asking your utility provider to turn over records uh, ex post. And that makes a pretty big difference from the Fourth Amendment point of view. I think that uh, the discussion has been remarkably robust actually in the private sector about whether or not utilities can share uh, or sell or store this type of information and how long they should be permitted to do it. Um, but the law enforcement piece of it has largely been missing. Um, I think that Part of the, from a, both from a privacy standpoint and from a consumer protection standpoint, um, part of this is that it's not clear that consumers will be able to opt out of the smart grid. 
um, or at least if they are initially, as the grid transforms and older meters are not interoperable uh, with the new grid, that opt-out will at some point become ineffective. Um, and I think that to ensure consumer trust during the deployment of this technology, which we really do need, uh, that privacy protections need to be a part of the discussion. Excellent. Thank you. And I commend to um, all law students and all law faculty to read Sonia's piece when it comes out in Jolt, which makes, in fact, some even more specific claims about the possible um, responses in law um, to the situation. So thank you. Um, there's also, I think, in addition to privacy concerns, I won't linger on them here, but a related set of security claims. I think this topic links up to Jonathan's uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, argument of yesterday. And I think the basic idea of making more connected our series of uh, systems and lives at the interaction level um, presents the possibility of the flow of data from one place to another in ways that um, may uh, add to vulnerabilities. Um, Scott, I don't know if you're willing to be put on the spot here for how higher levels of interoperability might or might not present security challenges, but uh, if you'd be willing to have a close call, uh, you're on. Well, the, the canonical example is the, um, the single monoculture of most uh, corporate uh, PCs, that almost all of corporate America uses uh, Macintosh, uh, uh, Windows yeah, PCs. You wish, you wish. I, I wish, but well, either way, the problem is still there, yeah. which means just like with a field of corn using a single strand of uh, a genotype, a particular disease, virus, whatever, uh, can wipe out the entire, uh, entire corporate eco-structure. Eco um, just because they are compatible, they are they are all the same. In, they're 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 ultimately inter interoperability because they're the same device. Uh, that's that can be uh, extremely extremely serious. And in general, uh, the fact that um, you have the same set of technology, the same set of standards that are that are used for um, all different uh, types of interaction. You mentioned uh, email. That's a stand a set of standards that's used by everybody. And if you have a way to transfer bad stuff, to use the technical term, um, it will work just fine with, with all platforms. Can I push you one bit more, Scott, though, in, in this topic? One of the distinctions that we draw in this book um, is to say that interoperability isn't always standardization in the sense that there are ways for things to be interoperable and not be exactly the same. Do you agree with this general statement? And how might that play out in the context of your last response? Uh, Interoperability comes from standards as one, one flavor of it. it. It's certainly the most common flavor of it in the internet. We have a set of standards that develop by the internet, the internet Engineering Task Force, which defines all of the fundamental things, including routing protocols and email, et cetera. And you may or may not have had a hand in the development uh, of some of those. A little bit. Google, Scott Bradner, and ICF, you'll get some answers. Um, but it's, it's a de facto um, interoperability that comes from People just, de developers just wanting to be able to communicate. A, a perfect example of that is the, uh, is the instant messaging. It used to be that instant messaging was completely siloed. If you were on um, AOL, you could only instant message to AOL. There was no way to interoperate. But that just, the, there wasn't a standards effort to overcome that. There was just people working reverse engineering and getting through that. Until Jabber, when there in fact was a standards effort. There was a standard, it didn't take. But, and this goes all the way back to the original CompuServe, which refused to c interconnect with the internet until some third parties, uh, people who just wanted to do that communication, set it up themselves by reverse engineering. Very helpful. Thank you. Always turning to Scott Bradner results in um, uh, shedding some light on issues. There are two important points about interoperability um, that are buried in, in what Scott said. One is interoperability doesn't need, mean only adopting exactly the same protocol or the standard. There are lots of ways to do it. I think one way to think about it in a sense is actually the notion of currency. Um, the fact that you can have lots of different currencies, in fact the Swiss franc coexists with the euro even within the um, European zone which can be uh, traded back and forth. They don't all have to be the same thing um, and yet the system might be made to work together and I think that's, um, you can have a very high level where everybody does have the same but you can also um, have important degrees. Um, the other one is to um, make the claim that I don't blame, we don't blame interoperability for these privacy and security concerns. Um, or the, some of the other concerns like sameness, where everything comes to the same. 
Um, the problem is, in fact, somewhat higher in the stack in a way. I think you might make the argument that you want the technologies and the data to be able to flow. You just want rules at higher levels that block the flow in certain circumstances. So from the security and the privacy perspective, the point was not that it was a problem that Google um, was, had made technologies that went together. It was the fact the way in which they rolled it out or the way in which they told people about it. Um, likewise with Facebook, there might be contexts in which it's great to have that interoperability but we need rules higher in the stack um, to do it. So the, the problem is not interoperability per se, but rather uh, an implementation question than how we need law or rules of various sorts to come in after them. Um, and Scott uh, pushes us really to this next um, key point, the fourth of our claims about interoperability, which is to say um, there's no one optimal way to get there. I think that um, Scott really teed it up effectively, saying that um, a single firm can create interoperability on its own, right? So one single firm could create a series of products, um, in this case, um, take Microsoft or Apple or Google, all of which have highly vertically interoperable um, uh, technologies within their own stack, which uh, effectively work together. That may be a very limited form of interoperability, just to do it as a single form firm, but it is possible to do it that way. Two firms can work together, Microsoft working with Novell as an example, a famous one where former competitors work together together, particularly in the business context, to come together. The most prominent example through the field um, of uh, information communication technologies is standards processes. And within that, um, there are also a broad range of uh, approaches that one could take. There can be very open standards processes, and there can be quite closed standards processes. And um, uh, there are a variety of reasons why you want this in uh, different cases. Um, Scott, go ahead. Just adding one more nuance, which is you can have applied interoperability by gatewaying. So you can have two inter non-interoperable systems, but something that talks to each of them and transfers between them. Exactly. I take that to be Urs's case in the digital TV context. There are lots of instances where you might have sort of hacks at some point that make a certain level of interoperability come about. It may or may not be optimal again, maybe relatively low. By, so by definition, any type of translation introduces error. Fair enough. So you may not want that particular kind of a hack, but it is, it is a mode to get there. Um, we've uh, introduced this framework um, that you can see on the screen here, from uh, ranging on the one hand from unilateral approaches um, down to the most uh, collaborative. And I think it's also important to look at um, another axis, which is um, a series of regulatory versus non-regulatory types of approaches. So interoperability is something that often prompted by consumers um, happens because firms uh, seem to make it so. Um, it might be unique about the web itself, um, simply that non-firm uh, actors, uh, people outside the firm context, seek to work together uh, and come to a level of interoperability. And I think um, particularly the web and email, um, some of the core systems have come about in those uh, modes. But I think it's also very important to note that the state has an important role here in creating interoperability um, at different levels and at different times. So um, in uh, one instance, in a um, sort of legal realism sense, of course, the background law that exists is crucial to the fact that interoperability comes about um, in many instances. Um, there also may be instances in which the state intervenes at some point um, in the process. There are a series of ex ante as well as ex post ways in which the state um, might get involved. Urs mentioned the example of emergency communications. There are a series of rules related to transportation, for instance, um, that uh, the state will mandate up front the fact that we need to be interoperable. We need to use a certain language in order to ensure that boats, for instance, um, can travel the waters together. That's an instance in which the market um, isn't coming forward with those rules, but um, the state mandates them up front. Um, and in, in circumstances like that, it may make very good sense from a public policy perspective to do that. Um, there are lots of instances where along the way the state will jump in one way or the other. Um, I would uh, emphasize the healthcare example. Right now in the context of healthcare reform, one of the very important topics is can we make electronic medical records about us, in fact, work together, to talk together? Now almost what, dozens of states have tried in different ways to come up with interoperable medical records in the, in the effort to get to um, uh, healthcare reform and a more efficient system, and nobody has succeeded. The, um, fact that uh, there are very low levels of interoperability among electronic medical records, including in places like Britain that have spent billions of pounds um, to accomplish it. Um, this is another area where, in fact, the state involvement, um, the Obama administration in the United States, I think is a good example of this, um, where they've stepped up and said, in fact, we are going to play a larger role. We're a procurer 
of these technologies. So we're going to demand a higher level of interoperability through our procurement power, for instance, or as a convener. I think the example of the smart grid, um, a regulated industry that Sonia talked about, may be another example where the state may have a role in that way. Um, and then last, the state may have a role ex post. Obviously, the kinds of tools like competition law uh, in European terms and interest in the United States terms are often blunt instruments. They often come after the fact. But it may well be that the United States um, or the European Union or others may need to jump in after the fact to make a claim that the way in which market actors uh, played in a particular context um, resulted in two low levels of interoperability. Um, there's a very complicated, interesting story of uh, Microsoft in this particular case. Our friend Emory Levins from Microsoft um, is here, in fact. Um, if you track the corporate history of Microsoft, you can see, in fact, some of the effects of different strategies of interoperability um, that we could get into uh, in some detail. We heard earlier in ILA um, a little colloquy, I think an implied colloquy, between Jonathan and Yokai about how open Microsoft's initial systems were. But I think there's an argument to say that the Microsoft operating system from the start was a highly interoperable one, in the sense that you could write um, .exe um, type files to run on the operating system of Microsoft. You then get to a period where plainly Microsoft, in the context of a case that was actually brought by our colleague uh, Phil Malone here on behalf of the United States, um, uh, was uh, deemed to have made systems not sufficiently interoperable. That there was a period in the antitrust um, case context where um, there were good, the claim was and uh, uh, ultimately um, uh, resulted in lawsuits both in the United States and Europe. Um, that they're not sufficiently interoperable in these ways. Um, and I would argue that the approach that Microsoft is taking now in cloud computing is more a return to the roots of the um, company's initial interoperability uh, approach where they, in fact, are seeking lots of ways in which uh, to make their uh, systems more interoperable um, in that original um, zone. I think it's a very good question to say, what is the role of the state versus the role of the firm in having created um, this trajectory within Microsoft or within any number of companies um, towards greater levels of interoperability. Does anybody want to pause on that topic since I went through a lot of important uh, history very quickly? Scott, are you? Uh, to to refer, refer, refer people to the AOL Time Warner merger, one of the issues in that was compatibility of instant messaging, and the FTC forced AOL to agree to come up with compatible, interoperable instant messaging. Absolutely. So that's a role of the state. Exactly. So the IM wars, I think, over the course of about a decade are another very good example. Um, you do see the rise of an open standard in the case of Jabber, and I guess it's XMLL, um, that uh, emerges from that. So that's a one open approach to try to make it happen. You also see the FTC intervening. The FTC ends up backing off a little bit later um, in that particular case. So it's an example of the government, I think, probably across administrations, having slightly different views about how intervention is to be. Um, but I think the IM example is a very strong one. I don't know, Phil or Emery, we have any interest in uh, jumping in on that relatively quick uh, tour I took? I, I mean, I think you captured it pretty well. That The European case in particular was focused in one half very much on whether or not Microsoft was allowing interoperability by rival server manufacturers with the Microsoft Monopoly desktop operating system. And the theory was that by limiting interoperability, by making Microsoft servers work particularly well with the desktop and not allowing other uh, servers to do that by sort of hiding the secret sauce, if you will, that you needed for, for real interoperability, that was hurting competition and ultimately hurting innovation and customer choice in the market. And the solution the Europeans came up with was forced disclosure, forced licensing of uh, protocols that would allow this sort of interoperability. Um, you know, big debates about whether that was the right thing to do, whether it really was causing the problems, but, but that was the core of their theory. Yeah, and John, I, I guess I would just say I, I think you are right to say that one of the outcomes of the antitrust case was we did kind of return to our roots and recognize that there was value in being more interoperable and less controlling. You know, it, was, it wasn't, uh, it was just a few years ago that I think Brad Smith stood in this room and Phil, you were, you were hosting the 10th anniversary of the Microsoft antitrust case and all the players were, were back together and, you know, honestly, the Microsoft people were a little nervous, like we're just going to get bashed all over again. And, and I just remember Brad standing up and saying, you know what, you guys won. It was a good thing that you won. And we've learned a lot. We're a different company than we were and, you know, it was incredibly painful and, in fact, we're finally out from under that consent decree. But in the end, it was a really good thing, just for us, for consumers, and for the industry. So, so thanks, Phil. <laughs> <laughs>
give a lot of credit to Brad Smith and you and others for showing up for that 10th anniversary of this lawsuit. That was one of those invitations we weren't sure was going to get um, accepted. But Sonia, go ahead. I just wanted to add a small point about the role of human and institutional interoperability in governance and standard setting. Um, particularly in the smart grid context, I think one of the real challenges has been that there's just so many people uh, who are involved in the effort to um, discuss and then to flesh out the either ex ante or ex post standards. You have everyone from state public utilities commissions to various um, you know, professional organizations to the Department of Energy and other actors. Um, so interoperability um, at the technical level really gets translated in a lot of different ways and, and all of these different sorts of interoperability have to themselves uh, work successfully together, I think, in order to find a solution. So it's a great point, and actually I think it, it makes two very important points about interoperability. One is um, that there may be a leadership role for the state or others to step forward and make sure that the right people are in the room. Um, the other is that there's a huge literature around the standards development process, and one of the claims around open standards processes is that they include more transparency of who the players are and so forth. It's a very important intersection, too, here to intellectual property law and the effect of having patents and other things that you have to check at the door in certain standards settings um, and, be, and you're required then uh, subsequently to license. So those are other reasons why a standards process um, uh, may be optimal in some cases to get to interrupt. Um, can you hit one more thing and then do I, I uh, uh, turn back to you. Um, uh, some of the means, I think, as we just noted, um, are better than others. The open standards um, approach, I think, is uh, very important um, to that. Um, but I think uh, it's also important to, to think about the problem, not just of interoperability on day one, but the problem of interoperability um, over time. I want to tie this to the um, discussion of digital humanities and of libraries from yesterday. One of the things I worry a lot about having some responsibility for libraries um, here at Harvard is that um, when we uh, acquire or digitize something in a certain format, um, are we in fact doing something that will have um, a relatively short um, lifespan relative to the length of time um, that, uh, say, a book. We have you know, these wonderful 13th century manuscripts, um, you know, copies of the Magna Carta that persist in our library. Um, and uh, to the extent that we are acting in such a way today that will not have that same um, level of, uh, of um, persistence over time. And I actually think one of the answers to this is, in fact, um, to think about this as an interoperability problem. It's not a, uh, an end all of the, the entire solution. But to the extent that we make a commitment that when you create a certain um, file in a certain file format, and you think about the possibility associated, for instance, with virtualization, the ability um, to run a variety of things on the same machine, um, that, that uh, interoperability over time may, in fact, be one of the ways to address this preservation of knowledge. Now, whether or not you need to have a state um, uh, actor come in and say, you must make things backward compatible over time um, versus whether or not the marketplace has a reason to do that, I think that's a, an open question. But I think that the notion of thinking about interoperability, not just uh, on day one, but um, over a period of time, uh, is a crucial part to the story. Thank you, John. So the next couple of slides are actually more or less highlighting and summarizing what John already covered. Um, I'd just like to add to the earlier chart that you've seen with the different types or means how to achieve interoperability that the real challenge, at least from my boring standpoint as a researcher, is um, to figuring out uh, what, what is the what's the perfect match or the best possible match between a given tool in the toolbox, and you've seen several of them, uh, and the particular interoperability problem. And that's not, uh, uh, again, not a um, uh, question that you can easily answer uh, because you have to, it's really a data problem. We don't have uh, that many uh, well-documented interop stories yet where we can, based on these, a review of these cases, draw firm conclusions, which is the best tool to use to solve a given problem. Uh, and that's, that's a methodological and a research challenge. Before you get into this, we do have a quick question clarifying um, the distinction, essentially, between translation and interoperability. Um, a while back, John, you'd used the currency metaphor to address um, reconciling interoperability and diversity. And I think there's just, we'd like some discussion of the difference between those two concepts. In fact, it's teed up through the euros to Swiss francs, which I think is a perfectly good uh, example for the Swiss guy to, to answer. I suspect the Matt who has jumped in on this may be Matt Becker. So maybe we can also end up throwing it uh, to Matt uh, partway through, too. Sure, Matt. You want to take this? 
So I actually, I wasn't directly involved in the, um, the Euro one, um, but I think uh, Translation is, is certainly a form of interoperability. It's really how things can work together. So it would be, translation I guess is similar to this kind of black box in the middle type thing where you have a, um, a currency converter who acts as the individual who will take your Swiss francs and transfer them to euros. Certainly when you have an issue such as a financial crisis where this has uh, come apart, that shows the limits of this particular method of interoperability. Another, of course, kind of uh, translation is up there in the corner, right, with blocks, just kind of the equivalent in the physical world. I think that the basic um, question, why is translation also an interop tool, is, uh, of course, much depends how you define interoperability. If you define interoperability as the ability to transfer and render information across systems, then you can see how this currency example is actually with, uh, uh, with uh, um, within the zone of interoperability tools. Now, um, one of the hardest questions actually, and, and John mentioned that already, uh, that we run into, and this is certainly also the most controversial one, is um, how to best, generally speaking, how to best uh, achieve interoperability with regard to the question, uh, shall we leave it to the uh, private sector is a laissez-faire approach, which I'm reluctant to accept as European, of course, uh, the right way to go, or shall we um, use the, the heavy-handed uh, sword uh, and intervene with uh, uh, ex-ante regulation and laws to achieve interoperability? So I think where we ended up, based on the review of, of the case studies we've, we've written, is um, in most of the cases, interop is actually best achieved uh, by the private sector through private sector cooperation in particular, uh, which doesn't mean, and we'll come back to that and John covered it already, which doesn't mean, of course, that the government doesn't play an important role, uh, especially ex ante. One of the great um, study, case studies in this context is uh, online music and uh, online entertainment content. Uh, uh, in particular, the example of digital rights management. Um, Jonathan has mentioned digital rights management systems already quite a bit. Uh, it's a rich example if you trace it back because, uh, as you may recall, digital rights management uh, was kind of a response to, to, to Napster, ultimately, symbolically speaking, uh, where suddenly um, music was available and shared over the web, got out of control in terms of uh, the a business model that was developed by the industry originally. And so the industry not only um, launched lawsuits, as we've heard, but also tried to put uh, um, uh, things back into the bottle uh, by wrapping digital content and securing digital content through digital rights management systems. Now lawmakers have then pushed, or the industry has pushed lawmakers to enact uh, so-called anti-circumvention laws that will protect digital rights management systems because of course hackers immediately found ways around uh, these um, technological protection layers and that led also to what I mentioned yesterday to the WIPO internet treaties and the anti-circumvention provisions in there that then later on were translated back into US law in uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Now there's been a lot of back and forth. France in an interesting response to all that, uh, enacted a law, so again, the government stepping in, to say, well, but DRM is bad because essentially it prevents interoperability. We now have this powerful online music provider, iTunes, of course, and Apple, coming to France, and our French music stores have a difficulty to compete due to strong network effects against or compete with Apple. So what can we do? Government said uh, we need to force Apple and providers alike to open up and uh, disclose interoperability information which allows competitors then uh, to build uh, interoperable devices like iPods, but the French version, right, and music stores. Now, of course, um, on the other hand side, the market in online music has developed as well. And as you all know, uh, over time, 
the music industry got more experimental, driven by consumer demand, and started to offer DRM-free music, even in the US and elsewhere. Now, in the meantime, DRM-free music is almost the standard, also it comes at a higher price, price in many instances, but has solved the interoperability through market uh, forces. Now, this is a great case study where you see how difficult it is uh, to time the relevant intervention once the government decides it's time, it's a good idea to intervene in a market, uh, still open uh, the question, what is the appropriate timing? So it's a really difficult question, how much government intervention and at what points in time uh, to be effective. Of course, the French um, intervention is not so relevant anymore given free DRM offerings on the market. Now another uh, angle uh, or kind of foot, just as a footnote to this story is that recently um, a new initiative has been launched and, and uh, Anne-Marie, sorry to put you on the spot again, probably you can tell us a little bit about ultraviolet and what is behind that since Microsoft played an important role. Actually I can't. <laughs> All right. All right. You could tell me yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ultraviolet is a um, consortium among 60 uh, ISPs, hardware, consumer electronics provider, but also software companies um, that have come together, especially with focus on movies, where DRM still plays an important role, and games, uh, and decided, look, we need to find a more uh, open system of distribution of content that feels more like what the kids experience on peer-to-peer -peer while still um, uh, have certain safeguards in place. So this is an industry consortium with Disney and others aboard. Uh, the one that is not part of it is Apple, uh, which allows you to register as a user uh, and share content across media types with six households, uh, sorry, with six members of the household, can also be friends, and almost experience limitless file sharing within uh, that uh, group of people so to mimic, in a way, the file sharing experience that you had online, but still DRM, um, using DRM protected content. So this is kind of a, another uh, illustration of, of the market trying to find the right balance and right degree of interoperability. We mentioned Microsoft as a, as a counter example where many of us would agree, of course, uh, that government intervention was much needed, maybe in contrast to this Fran French episode that I just mentioned. All this is just to say it's really not an easy question to answer how much government involvement and, and when. I will be very brief on this one that uh, John has covered, that, that of course the law uh, uh, should also be used um, as a means to foster interoperability where, where possible, and in particular to address some of the new problems that emerge once we have a more interoperable ecosystem. The Google Boss case, uh, uh, the healthcare case you mentioned are all great examples where the government uh, involvement is desirable from a normative uh, viewpoint at least uh, from where we stand. John also mentioned already that the law uh, obviously has different, or lawmakers have different instruments in the toolbox to foster interoperability, we have also seen it uh, on, the, on this map and uh, the distinction also that uh, Sonia made between ex ante and exposed tools is helpful. Exposed tools, of course, mostly competition law. And Phil, maybe this is a question for you. Uh, how, how, how do you think about uh, the power of exposed intervention when it comes to interoperability? Uh, how efficient is this tool? How costly is this tool? What are the benefits and drawbacks? Yeah, I mean, Sean described it as a, a very blunt instrument, and I think it is. It's always much harder to come along after the fact when an industry has developed products, services has have developed, consumer expectations have been set, and try to undo things. And to the extent that, for example, the European Union action against Microsoft hasn't necessarily resulted in a big explosion of competition in the server space, one argument is, the Europeans' argument is that it came too late. So much was already locked in place. These are markets subject to network effects where things tip, and it's really hard to undo that. So I think after the fact, government intervention is the least desirable. It's often much better than nothing. And you know, again, in the case of the US Microsoft case, limited as the final 
outcome was, I think it still made a big difference both in the specific sense as well as in the broader corporate culture sense that Anne Marie talked about. Um, I think it's, it's far better to create more carrot versus stick positive opportunities up front to spur interoperability. And, and yet there is a concern, and I, I go back to your French legislation and the Apple situation uh, for a second. You know, Apple's position, and I think not an unreasonable one, is that it was their closed system. It was their non-interoperable music store system in the first instance that did what no one else had been able to do. You remember the studios tried, lots of people tried to come up with an effective online um, music sales system as opposed to, to, you know, just file sharing and failed. I mean, it just didn't happen. It was finally Apple that had the model that did it and they were able to succeed in part because it wasn't interoperable and it was able to offer the studios enough certainty about uh, DRM and not losing track of their stuff that, that they would go along and license it. And Apple has a pretty good argument that if the government had stepped in much earlier, if the French you know, or the US had said at the very beginning, no, 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 you can't do it this way, you have to make it interoperable, then it would never have worked. It would have killed that innovation. So there's always this flip side of government intervention too early perhaps chilling an innovative model that is necessary, maybe even some of the, the lack of interoperability is necessary to, to succeed in the market. It's very helpful, thank you, Phil. It also is a good reminder that I actually didn't mention one of the important wrinkles to this competition law interop, or competition and interop relationship that of course there is also a strand within economic theory that suggests that it's not always good um, to foster innovation by having too much competition. So we have heard about Schumpeter and, and the theory of, um, uh, uh, and his theory of uh, competition in the lecture of uh, Eric von Hippel. And of course, there are arguments to be made if you compete for the entire market and not only for a market share that you have stronger incentives to innovate. And this is a, an excellent illustration here. Just to um, end here and then we open up, I think, quickly is uh, as far as ex-ante approaches are concerned, it's important that this doesn't necessarily mean imposing standards or mandating standards. Of course, as John already said, uh, again, the, the repertoire of governments is more nuanced. <coughs> Cloud computing is a great example here in the US. Vivek Kundra was with us earlier this week who um, uh, 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 used the, uh, the purchasing power of governments uh, uh, to create a more interoperable computing environment through the compu cloud computing in the, uh, initiative. Regulation by threat, there is an interesting uh, case study coming from Europe about cell phone charges that I encourage you to look into where, the, where it was sufficient that the government threatened to uh, mandate the standard to get the industry players together and working something out that we don't produce 51,000 tons of waste with uh, uh, redundant cell phone charges in a year. Uh, I think the, the slide I want to end with is, is the following. Um, the bi-directional relationship between interoperability and the law. So we talk now uh, a little bit about the ways in which law can be used to increase interoperability. But there is also an interoperability problem within law itself, and that ties back to the session on jurisdiction we had yesterday. We've seen how non-interoperable laws can cause a lot of problem uh, for online business. And there is an argument to be made that part of these interoperability layers that we discussed uh, include a, a legal layer, and that we as lawyers and legal scholars and of course policy and lawmakers also have to think about how can we increase the interoperability of our own legal, national legal systems, China uh, being a great example here where again uh, one area at least where interoperability has been increased, legal interoperability, the case of the WTO accession actually increased competition and innovation within the country as various uh, studies uh, indicate. So I think we end here. John, do you want to cover no, this I think, one? No, I think, the, this I think the final point yeah. is only that this is a really good time to think about what optimal interoperability looks like and how we get there, particularly in the context of highly complex systems that are emergent. So I think we have extremely good examples 
like the web itself, like email and so forth, which are generative platforms. They allow for the kinds of uh, cooperation and firm and non-firm innovation that we've seen um, broadly. Um, we've also seen a history where um, more and more um, systems have been built that are less interoperable in various ways. Um, and I think particularly as we look at the emergence of cloud computing, of Internet of Things, of the healthcare record, the smart grid, these are moments where interoperability by design um, will matter a great deal. Um, and thinking about how a range of different actors work together to get us to optimality and then to get to um, a way in which we can keep that interoperability optimal over time, not to get locked in, like with the air traffic control system um, or the example that Doc just um, sent around by, uh, by the back channel, um, the plug system, where um, people get locked into non-interoperable um, systems uh, over time. Um, so maybe we'll end there, and if we can uh, take the five minutes that remain on that particular clock for, uh, um, for reactions and pushback, um, uh, that'd be great. Matthew. I'd love to hear where we're wrong, of course. That's, this is an invitation to push back. So I just wanted to emphasize a little bit the, um, uh, the network effects that Phil had mentioned. I think that's, it's really important to look at how, uh, in many cases, uh, people do want to adopt certain interoperable technologies or certain solutions, but they can't agree on which one's going to be the correct one. And oftentimes, uh, essentially, nobody wants to be the equivalent of the HP touchpad user who just had everything dropped on them. You know, you, you don't want to be the first person to a, a, adopt a new healthcare record type and then have nobody else do it. And, and government really does play an interesting role here. Um, one example I wanted to bring up was actually with um, with barcode adoption. Something that I found was very interesting was uh, was the question of how do you get everybody, all of the um, the manufacturers in the industry, to start putting barcodes on their on their labels. And it was actually government intervention uh, that created this, but in a way that wasn't really expected. The government had essentially told all uh, food producers that they would have to put nutritional information on their labels. So a massive redesign of labels was already slated for some time in the 1970s when um, an in industry consor consortia basically came around and said, while we're doing this, why don't we also put barcodes on them? It's great. And Matthew's done some really interesting work also looking at why barcodes um, did emerge in the way they did, but why, for instance, RIFIDs have not so much. Um, and QR codes, I think, is the next example um, where, in fact, we see lots of adoption of QR codes in these kind of funny ways um, as kind of a better version of the barcode. And I think there's some really good stories as to why different things did or didn't happen there. Yeah, that's another interesting example of network effects where we have some serious lock-in problems. Basically, you have an interoperable solution that w worked very well, perhaps too well, because now people don't want to move on from that particular solution to one that might be even more efficient. I think the air traffic control is a good example of that as well. Other reactions and particularly critiques, pushback? We can't possibly be right in all those 10 claims. Scott? Just another note on the comment about uh, iTunes. Apple's argument was also that they were completely interoperable on M MP3. And that the, the argument that Steve Jobs made in his, in his letter was that uh, the majority of stuff on um, iPod, iPods was actually MP3, ripped CDs. But, uh, so that in reality, the percentage of non-interoperable stuff was relatively small. I think one of the challenges in most interoperability debates is at what level should you mandate the interoperability, right? So is it enough to say that you can use an unencrypted you know, MP3 file in any of these different systems, or is it in fact much more important to focus on you know, what are the effects on innovation? What are the effects, for instance, on consumer choice and autonomy and so forth of having a more broadly interoperable system? And at what point you know, can, we, can we force that? Alicia? I've got a question sort of on that note. Um, Frank would like you to discuss how we should reconcile interoperability with diversity of ideas, languages, participants, all kinds of diversity. That's an amazing point. Do you want that one? Um, thank you. It's a very, very hard question. One that we play out in the book is the distinction um, between uniformity and standardization and so forth on the one hand and diversity on the other. Um, and I think this goes to some of the discussion I was having with Scott about um, what do we consider to be interoperability. I think one of the downsides of highly interoperable systems in some cases is high levels of uniformity, right? That we get to a point at which um, at some level we're mandating things to be the same. Um, and that's often true with sort of maximally interoperable things. Worse use the example in, a, in their traffic control of mandating not just English but a 
specialized version of English, and I noted somebody in the question tool was talking about cultural imperialism and so forth, which is quite right to think about on that level, and it's a concern. Um, on the other hand, um, one of the things that um, interoperability is great at doing is allowing diversity to flourish often above that level. So I think this actually is one of the ways in which the um, interoperability discussion marries up with the generativity discussion and the uh, cooperation and other ones that we've looked at, which is if you get interoperability right at a certain level, it can allow for different forms of diversity to flourish. Another way to look at it, the second way, is to say um, interoperability doesn't demand for things to be the same, it demands that they work together in different ways. And so in instances where what you want to do is to have lots of different kinds of systems, that's where you think about the middleware that Scott was talking about. You may get to suboptimal interoperability among them, but you may be benefiting in the sense of uh, maintaining a certain degree of uh, diversity. And I think that's um, actually one way in which these different layers help us to explain it. Ken? A really mundane example that we can all sort of think through just in our own experience. It, the plug example got me thinking of it as batteries, mm -hmm. you know, where you can have a flourishing, you know, there are standard interoperable batteries, but now we've moved beyond those because, you know, for various market reasons, um, because of wanting to innovate and the value of the innovation is sufficient that an expensive battery is warranted, you know. Yeah, I think it's a good example. Scott? I'd like to bring this back to the beginning of the uh, week, which is the internet is interoperable at the IP layer. Right. Uh, this is your common layer that you just spoke of. And I just want to remind people that that's what's made the internet to what it is, is that level of interoperability. Very simple, non-involved, non-directive, ability to move packets around and get them to the right destination. And which how many is, patents on that technology, Scott? Luckily, not okay. enough. Uh, yeah, I, it has not been interrupted. The process has not been interrupted. And by the way, if it had been, it, they'd be over by now. But the other thing is that uh, the fact that you have interoperability in email standards so that the message that I send to you uh, is completely interoperable. Does not mean that the, th the view you have of that email is the same view as I have, because we can use different user interfaces, right. and they can be completely different. You can have huge amounts of innovation at the edges, and the standard of the stuff going between is what's, what's driving, that, enabling that innovation. To me, that is a perfect note to end on, Urs. I don't know if you want a, a last word, but this seems to me... Uh, I would appreciate good. the last word yep. in the sense of uh, acknowledging that this uh, book and the research behind it, as you, I think, guessed by now, has been a huge um, team effort. Uh, I would certainly like to acknowledge the great work of the student researchers, including Matt, uh, led by Caroline Nolan, who did a fantastic job. Uh, we also had terrific workshops and conversations with colleagues from industry, inclusive uh, Anne-Marie Levins, to no small part, so thanks to you. And of course, also thanks to all of our colleagues, including Jochai and Terry and all the faculty that has uh, presented during this week uh, for making uh, this research possible, although they may disagree in no small part uh, on certain uh, claims that we make, but I think that's, again, very much in, in the spirit uh, of Berkman, um, what we presented today here, uh, as at least as far as the process of research is concerned. So a big thank you. Thanks. All right.